Hello BSC 6003 students, Dr. Conway here for lesson 9 on communicating in a language that financial decision makers will understand. Uh, it's usually about now I like to have that because we've been dealing a lot with the technical aspects of setting up your your cost benefit analysis with your baseline case and and three green uh, investment options uh, for your for your projects. It's it's now that students can often lose track of the fact that this stuff still needs to be written up as a business case for people who do not uh, who are not energy management experts, right? So. I want to return at this point just to, just to, you have to finish the technical aspects I've been discussing about, but I want to pull you back from that and remind you of what the business case and how it has to be put together and the right tone that it has to hit uh, when you do a business case, all right? And other strategic considerations related to what, what can happen, you know, uh, as you get a business case adopted, where to go with it, all right? So let's, let's deal with that today. Um, uh, fairly quickly and uh, we'll go from there okay now <clears throat> remember that the business case must explain and this is from earlier lectures that we've lessons that we've had you know must explain what change is desired I've indicated to you that that when you offer change to an organization you should always give options for that change why do we give options for the change because you know, if all we do is give the person one thing to consider and the answer is no, you have nowhere to go with that, particularly as a consultant or a contractor in energy management, but also as an employee. If the answer is no because you haven't given uh, your uh, decision maker a proper gradation of options, then you basically, you know, you got one foot in the door and now the door is closed. You have no other basis for discussion with that person, all right? So that's why I want to give a low-hanging fruit option, a middle-of-the-pack option, and a, and a strenuous option related to these are what I call the full Monte option. Uh, you have to be very clear, remember, in your business case, the reasons for the change, all right? And so you can't, you know, you, you and, and, and reasons for change, as we've discussed prior to, is that it, obviously it's financial savings from energy management that are involved, but uh, there are other strategic advantages, as have you seen in the course so far. There are, there are preparing for the future, preparing for the future policy and regulatory environment dealing with climate change. There are the arguments of improving the brand of the organization. There are fitting with the organizational objectives if the company wants to be a green company, etc., etc., etc. So yes, definitely the financial savings. But a business case in energy management is more than just about the financial savings, okay? Um, you, your business case needs to be clear on the proposed projects to enable the change. That's your model, your, your green option one, your green option two, and your green option three, okay? The, re the way the projects could be delivered needs to be discussed in your business case, right? You can't just say, well, let's do this. Well, you know, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, it might be quite complicated how you would implement that uh, those changes for example if you're you live in a house with your family and you want to do a bunch of renovations one of the first things that you'll discover if you're doing renovations while living in your house is that logistics become 10 times more important than the actual financial investment because you're managing your life and you're mad with just the same thing goes with a company right if it's going through a transition it needs to be very clear how that transition will be performed so as not to fatally disrupt the the activities of the organization so the way the projects will be delivered is a critically important consideration in any business case all right and then of course at what costs and benefits measured in financial terms and we've discussed a lot about costs and benefits so be very clear on that obviously in your business case and don't forget the risks and risk mitigation elements of your, of your proposed decision what will happen if something goes wrong what is our fallback position if something doesn't work the you know in in cases where those issues are applicable you have to discuss them in your business case now you may discuss them in summary in your business case because you have another document that lays out the implementation plan for your energy management program but uh, nevertheless, it needs to be covered off in your business case. So when you're writing up your business case, even though we've been emphasizing a lot the issue of the financial aspects, remember a business case is about building an argument of which 
finance is one key component, but not the only component, all right? You recall from the very first lesson here, we talked about the types of sections that would typically be in a business case. So don't forget these, right? Background information, project statement, what, you know, why are we here, right? The objectives, what is it that we're trying to achieve? Remember, linking to corporate organizational objectives. The current situation, that's your baseline, what's going on? Describe it verbally in addition to your financial, you know, tables that lay out your technological baseline, right? Um, you need to discuss that current situation. Recommended solutions, right? Because your three options are possible. Success criteria and measures. Remember, one of the things we learned was is that one of the great failings, why energy management business cases fail at a higher rate than is typical of other areas of expertise, is that you know that the failure to clearly, um, you know, have success criteria and measures. How and any financial investor is going to ask, how will I know? How will I know if, if I've been successful with this money I've spent or not, okay? Any support required, right? Who needs to be involved in the implementation? I mean, you're not doing it all yourself. Who needs to be engaged? Remember, at the start, we talked about forming the energy management team and, and who would be involved and who would be advising the development of the business case. Who, therefore, participate in developing the business case and now feels like they own part of it. And so they're going to argue for it with the operations manager and the director of marketing and so on because they've been a measure, member of the team in developing that. But these people will also become a member of the team in implementation. All right? So you have to be very clear on that. And risk and risk mitigation and next step and timelines for implementation is an important section typically in a business case. So don't forget these structural considerations and don't forget the broader strategic considerations because there's a tendency for students to do that when they get kind of engulfed by the technology and the numbers. Yes, that's really critically important, but then you have to pull yourself back up and write this thing up, right? Write this thing up that's going to be convincing to people who are not energy management experts. They're marketing experts, or, or most importantly, of course, your president, your CEO, or your CFO, your chief financial officer, are the ones you got to convince. They're not energy management experts, all right? They're, they're concerned about organizational objectives. They're concerned about good use of scarce resources and opportunity costs. They're concerned about you know broader strategic implications of the business direction with respect to energy. And how is that going to contribute to us being a greener organization? Or how is that going to contribute to us being more popular with our stakeholders or more popular with our suppliers or, or whatever the case may be, whatever may be on their mind? You should have already discovered this by talking to people in the organization before you ever prepared your business case. And then you make sure that those they see themselves in that business case because they see something of value for them in that business case. Because if they see something from value for them in that business case, they will own it. They will adopt it. They will encourage it. All right. But if all you do is give them burden, no ben no clear demarcation of benefit, then then it's going to be tough to sell in any organization, in any work workplace situation. It's going to be tough to sell that business case. All right, sorry, I went one too far. Okay, uh, and remember that we want to avoid the problem of energy speak, right? We discussed this before. You know, I want you to itemize all the technology, but the way you itemize it, it's okay that those, you know, those be clear in the, in the, and if there's anything technical, push it back into an annex, all right? Because if the CFO, CFO or the CEO or the president gets this document, and they'll, they'll give it to their technical people to sort out things, but the main body needs to sell the people who are your main decision makers. It's not another energy manager that's going to be making that decision as to whether to adopt your business case or not. It's the finance people. It's the management people. It's the marketing people. It's what whoever is carrying currency with the organization's objectives, all right? But there are key messages, right? You know, dollar to, well, dollar terms are straightforward. There are a bunch of other sort of things that are strategic. And I just give you some list on here of things of what the, the industry is showing. You know, better uh, management of green issues, particularly in the context of climate change, is improving access to capital. You probably have seen reports of big financial companies pulling out of the oil patch. Big financial companies now looking at climate change as a financial risk. 
right? Making it hard for peop corporations that are not uh, responsible with respect to energy and greenhouse gases, making it tougher for them to get access to capital. People are pulling their risk out of those sectors because they don't like the risk profile of investing in companies that aren't being responsible with respect to climate change mitigation, all right? Um, we know that you know a lot of these green companies that do adopt this. The, the data shows they they have improved financial performance and increased shareholder value for many of the same reasons that relate to access to capital. We obviously know that better energy management reduces oper operating costs, make your organization more competitive. These are all messages that can be highlighted in a business case, you know, and substantiated by research that's been done. Enhanced corporate reputation and brand, that's obviously a key consideration that can be talked about in any business case. Uh, there's going to be increased calls for, for disclosure with respect to greenhouse gas emissions. You might have to start reporting to government on your GHG emissions. If you set up a proper energy management program, you can do that. You can manage that. You can show steady performance. So the government then talks to your corporate sector. You can say, okay, well, we've got some road to go here, but you guys have been doing a decent job, you know, trying to improve things. So the government then is in a cooperative, engaged mood rather than a, hey, you're not doing your part mood. And that's, that's a quite a different uh, set of scenarios, so, right? Uh, increased corporate sales and customer loyalty. You know, customer loyalty in this day and age when people are concerned about climate change, they're concerned about the environment. If you're a corporation that says, you know, we're a company that's moving gradually towards net zero, or we're a company that's, that's trying to be a leader in terms of energy efficiency and greenhouse gas mitigation in our sector, all of these things can become very valuable to the company's bottom line, right? We have increased productivity and quality can be a result of enhanced energy management, right? Uh, attracting employees to the corporation can be a very important consideration. If you look at every major study that's done of prime universities in North America, and there have been studies like this done, and you ask students where they would like to work, and, and, and you list a green company compared to just a run-of-the-mill company, even if the run-of-the-mill company is paying a bit more money, students disproportionately, substantially disproportionately, the best graduates choose the green company. That's, that's data that has been proven by Harvard studies and by the Pew Center studies and other studies have demonstrated this fact, right? Plus, if you're a very green and responsible company and you're working with the government on these types of things, you might have less regulatory oversight with respect to your energy use, right? When they bring in more greenhouse gas mitigation measures, but government regulation and so on. You also have, if you can demonstrate supply chain responsibility, not only working with your own company on energy management, but working with suppliers so that they're following certain codes. If they want to be our supplier, they have to follow certain codes. Companies do that these days, all right? All of these, I'm giving you examples, but all of these factors can be, can be relevant to, to some business cases. And if they are relevant, you need to flag these strategic considerations. Don't get bogged down in energy speak. Talk about the money, obviously. You know, is this, this, does this make sense in a cost-benefit context? But there's more than that, all right? And I recognize that in your business cases, we're not going to be able to monetize all of these things. But do flag them, okay? And, and, and do uh, demonstrate that you can talk about them, all right? And then you always have to remember in a business case, too, that there's, you know, a lot of the times when you talk to people who are in this field and why business cases in energy management can fail is because the reader often views the business case as a cost, as if inaction has no cost, all right? But we have learned that, that inaction also has a cost. That's why we do a baseline scenario, right, the way we are over the 25 years, because you're showing... Uh, the client that inaction also has a cost and the whole point is is that inaction costs more than action all right that's the nub of the business of the financial aspects of your business case right but you'd be surprised how many managers who are never focused on energy management before just see energy management as a cost as if doing nothing would have no cost which is completely false we know that that is false right we know that there are costs. I just gave you a long list of areas where the reverse would be costs. Okay, so remember, you need to talk about the fact that you know no, no action has costs. All right, 
flag that. You'd be surprised how many people can read that will look at that spreadsheet comparing your baseline to your three options and, and, and not even recognize that in that baseline case are embedded costs of inaction. If you do not act, this is what will happen. Your costs will go up this much percentage over the, this, the action scenarios. And, but, but there are other impl implications too, which is the reverse of that list I just gave you. We might, it might be tougher to get access to capital. There might be impending regulatory action. There might be all, so the reverse, the flip side of the coin of these other benefits of action become costs of inaction. All right, so don't forget that theme of costs of inaction when you're doing a building case, uh, your case, right? The other thing you have to realize is when you're doing a business case for the first time for a client, or for an employer is you need to be aware of the need to build confidence. That's the other reason that I suggest a low hanging fruit option, a middle of the road option and a high end option or a full Monty option. Because often when the trust is not there, you're a new employee or you're a new contractor to the company or whatever, there's going to be that initial apprehension. Well, who is this person? I'm not 100 You know what? Let's go. Let's let's do the low hanging fruit option with them and let's see how it goes. All right. And that's going to be a natural human instinct to manage risk, right? That's, that's going to be quite common. But the beauty of going through the three options is that, yes, okay, they only took the low-hanging fruit because they're building confidence. But what you gave them, if you give them success in the low-hanging fruit because you have criteria and measurement for benefits, then they already have a vision of where you would take them in options two and options three. So you already have established the foundations for an ongoing dialogue once you have proven that option one can be successful for them and that made sense in cost benefit terms okay and so because nothing breeds openness and cooperation to do more than than confidence that the last action you did with a person produced positive results all right what does that mean well you have to produce positive results what does that mean it means you have to be able to measure it and demonstrate that you've produced positive results right which is what we discussed just a couple of minutes ago so building confidence and trust is really, really critical, and you need the data to do that, right? You need the data to be able to demonstrate success. So don't ever under, uh, underestimate the vital importance of, of, of everybody understanding how you're going to measure performance from your business case. How are you going to demonstrate the results that you got from your actions, all right? Because that is everything to moving to the next level. All right. You can't go back and sell them again, and you know, with another business case, and 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 not be able to demonstrate that the first effort was a success. Duh. Common sense, right? So you need to be able to, to make that very very clear in any business case, right? And the other thing is, is that once you do this, you go through this process, and you're building confidence. If you're working for that company as a full-time employee then one of the key strategic considerations you want to get is you want to be able to start to get those, the way you measure performance, the ways you account for performance and all that, the strategic considerations that we discussed. You want to start to work at getting those things integrated into the corporate documents. So if their corporate strategy doesn't have an energy chapter in it, it should have an energy chapter in it. So once you, you know, because then you become, you've completely integrated the corporate, into the corporate culture and the corporate operations, the, the, the principle of energy management. So it's now in your corporate plan. It's now in your accounting system. Remember I told you that one of the big barriers to energy management projects is, you know, investments in technology show as a capital cost. But the, the, the benefits of those capital is not necessarily accounted for in the ongoing savings of operating costs. There are different ways of setting up accounting statements to be able to demonstrate a clear link between capital expenditures and operating cost reduction. But a lot of corporations don't have their accounting system set up that way to be able to account for that. So, you know, you know, the best energy managers, once they get into a company, they, they get some of those they get some of that education work done that's more than just about cost. There are other strategic considerations. They link well to corporate objectives. Then they run, they, they have a business case. They demonstrate some early results, positive results in the business case. They build confidence and trust. They have a good team they've built around them. And then as things move along, they start to kind of go to the corporate strategic planning meetings and all of this, and they get energy management integrated into the performance criteria of the organization 
right? And they talk to the accounting department and, and the CFO's department and they say, how are we account, when we make energy expenditures, how are we accounting for the benefits of that? Is it, is it buried in the general operating cost line? Or is there any way we can separate that out to show a direct link towards the positive investments in energy efficiency and we're getting results on performance that we can cons now s clearly see, right? So a lot of operating costs, they'll break out things like marketing costs, labor costs, all of these kind of things. But you'll find that energy is just married, buried in a, in a general cost budget line, right? There's no way of separating that out from buying coffee or buying, you know, putting gas in cars or, or any number of other uh, item that could be buried in that miscellaneous operating cost line. You don't want that. You want that broken out so that the, you know, the trend line on savings can be seen as a relationship to these capital expenditures. Because right now, in a lot of organizations, those capital expenditures will simply be seen as a debt item on the books. And there's be no clear link to the benefits of those those items, right? So all of these things about integrating into an organization become critically important as you go along. And when you see a top-notch organization on energy management, that's all there. The accounting system, they can they, they have it set up to relate, you know, ex capital expenditures on energy savings to energy costs. Uh, you know, they, they have it, you know, there's an energy management chapter in their, in their corporate strategic plan. There's, a, there's an energy management chapter in the corporate operational plan. There's obligations placed on each key manager on how they manage energy in their terms of reference and their job description. There's a section in there on energy. All of that stuff has become integrated. And when you see an organization like that, you know, this is an elite organization in terms of managing energy and the impact on the environment, all right? Because it's integrated. So they hire a new uh, director of operations or a new VP of operations, and you will see the difference. You will look at the, the job description of that VP in a green organization, and there will definitely be a section in there on that person's responsibility for sound energy management. Okay, you go to a company that isn't sophisticated, and it'll all be about operations and hiring people and measuring how many units you produce per month and all this stuff. But there'll be nothing in there on energy, all right. And and so these are all the things that we go through, right? Strategic things that we go through when we want to be effective energy managers, all right. So on that, I just wanted to take this opportunity on today's lecture to remind you, you know, stay, you know. Get, you have to do the finance stuff. You have to do the cost benefit. But remember, there's a broader context, okay? Remember, we're doing three models because you're creating a phased approach. If you're working with a client that, that maybe is, doesn't have the trust with you yet, the low hanging fruit option gives them something to test you out with. From your point of view, you have to be able to measure performance so that you can talk to them about option two and option three later on because you've built trust, you've demonstrated success, now we can start to talk. And as you're doing that, if you're an employee, then you begin to integrate it into the company. And that's the, the role of a very effective energy manager. And if you see a good company that really is trying to become net zero, right? Some companies have announced that they want to become net zero. And like Loblaws and big, big food processing companies and retailing companies like that. You will, I will guarantee you, you will see job descriptions of, of executives it doesn't matter what department they're in. They will have something in there on sound management of energy and other environmental considerations like packaging and things like that. We'll be Even if that's not their principal mandate, they're the, they're the warehouse, the VP of warehousing, but they will have stuff in there on that because you know, they've reached a level of sophistication where all that is now integrated into all key corporate documents from job descriptions all the way up to the accounting system and integrate it into the corporate sustainability strategy, all right? And so a lot of the organizations you will encounter in your, encounter in your careers will be starting at that low end. They, will, they might not even be metered properly, but this is the journey, right, of taking an organization through to more sophisticated treatment of, of energy considerations, all right? So on that, keep working on your, uh, on your business cases. Uh, we'll be talking tomorrow in a Zoom call about your business cases and I'll be taking any further questions you have 
on that because that's your chance to really take a run at, at your final questions, okay? So we'll be talking to you uh, tomorrow, Tuesday at 3 o'clock. Bye-bye now.